Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Russ Feingold, and I am president of the American Constitution Society, uh, the country's foremost progressive legal organization with more than 200 student and lawyer chapters across the nation. ACS is now celebrating its 20th year of shaping legal debate, nurturing the next generation of lawyers, judges, and advocates, and ensuring that the law is a force to improve the lives of all people. But we are especially focusing our work in this anniversary year on our Constitution's founding failures when it comes to race and equality in this country and reckoning with our past to create a more just future. If you don't already, we encourage you to follow ACS on social media, including on Twitter at ACS Law. You can also find us online at acslaw.org. There you can join ACS and find more information about upcoming events and opportunities. Today's discussion, founding failures, the consequences of the Constitution's original sin for our criminal legal system is the second in our year-long series of events investigating the intersection of race, our Constitution, and the law. Thanks to a sustained outcry by those most at risk of suffering harm at the hands of our criminal justice legal system, we as a country are perhaps more aware than ever of the unjust, violent treatment that too often characterizes policing in black communities, indigenous communities, and other communities of color. Among the myriad ways that systemic racism harms BIPOC communities, policing is perhaps the most visceral and immediate. Since the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri and the protests that followed, Americans who had previously been able to ignore this epidemic of police violence have been forced to confront it. More and more we see on the news and our social media feeds the ways in which BIPOC communities are targeted for excessive policing that too often leads to violence. As we speak, of course, the nation watches the trial of Derek Chauvin, the former police officer charged with the murder of George Floyd. Police violence is perhaps the most high profile example of historical institutional racism. But the criminal legal system's racialized violence is not limited to policing. The types of behavior that we choose to criminalize, to the people for whom we set excessive bail, to the creation of mandatory minimum sentences that have helped lead to our mass incarceration crisis, our criminal legal system has played a large part in our nation's history of systemic institutionalized racism. White supremacy stain on our criminal legal system can be seen in the slave patrols, the chain gangs and the war on drugs, but also in less obvious areas like loitering, disorderly conduct and trespassing law. For us to design solutions for this generation's old crisis, we have to understand its roots. But fortunately for us, today's panel of impressive speakers is going to help us understand that past and how we can chart a more just path forward. So now I'm going to turn it over to our moderator for this conversation, Jamiles Lardy, the staff writer for the Marshall Project, a nonprofit news organization dedicated to reporting on the U.S. criminal legal system. Previously, Jamiles worked as a reporter for The Guardian, covering issues of criminal justice, race, and policing. He was a member of the team behind the award-winning online database, The Counted, tracking police violence in 2015 and 2016. In 2016, he was named a Michael J. Feeney Emerging Journalist of the Year by the National Association of Black Journalists. While there is so much more to be said about Jamil's expertise and professional accomplishments, it's clear that we have an excellent facilitator for today's discussion. Jamil. Russ, thank you so much for those kind words. Uh, good morning for all of those uh, around the Mississippi and places west. Uh, good afternoon to all of you on the East Coast. Um, as Ross said, my name is Jamiles Larte. I'm a staff writer with the Marshall Project, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to be your moderator for today's event on the consequences of the Constitution's original sin on the American criminal legal system. Um, that original sin, of course, being the peculiar institution of chattel slavery and the attendant ideology of 
white supremacy, um, which underwrote that system. Um, a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, today's call is being recorded, and the recording will be available after the call on the ACS's website at www.acslaw.org. Uh, we will be taking questions after our presenters are finished with their remarks. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, you can type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any time during this call. And we ask that you not use the chat function to submit questions for Q&A um, as they may get overlooked there. Um, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. And finally, a bit of deep housekeeping. One and a half credits of California CLE credit is available for this call. Uh, please email info at acslaw.org with founding fathers, race and the criminal legal system in the subject line to receive that credit. If you are seeking CLE credit in a jurisdiction other than California, please consult the rules of that state's board to see if it provides for reciprocity with California. CLE materials can be found on the event page of the ACS website and will be shared with participants in a follow-up email. Uh, as a non-lawyer, I hope you all get your Cleveland credits because that's my best guess on what all of that was about. Uh, I, I, I would love to um, hear from all of our panelists kind of in succession, uh, and then hopefully we can open it up a bit from there. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Tajania Henderson, the Dean of Rutgers University Graduate School in Newark. Um, and I was hoping you could speak with us a little bit today about the origins of policing. Um, what in that history speaks to present questions of racial discrimination and of populations being policed inequitably? Are there places there in that history where we see uh, either the original constitutional sin of slavery um, or where we see alternatively kind of the imprint of the libertarian protections um, promised in the Bill of Rights? I have to say thank you first to ACS and to uh, Russ Feingold, its leader, and to everyone who has joined us today. Um, Jamal, this is a great question, so um, thank you for that. When it comes to policing, this country's history has uh, really uh, two origin stories. That first origin story is an origin story that grows out of um, urban unrest and uh, the presence of poor people in places like Boston and in New York City. Our first organized municipal police department in this country is in Boston, and it is organized for the purpose of protecting property. There is, there is a concern here with ensuring that those property classes are not overrun by the non property classes. That second origin story is an origin story that begins fully in the South. We see this in places like Virginia, we see it in South Carolina, and we see it throughout the region in the colonial period, and that is the organization of either uh, citizen patrols or actual law enforcement officers, either county sheriffs or constables or whatever the term might have been, have, whatever term might have been used in the jurisdiction. Here, we see the primary function of these units, these organized bands of law enforcers to be the control of enslaved people and the return of enslaved people who have sought their freedom. We recognize, because this is a, this is a rich history and a story that it has been told and continues to be told, that those early Southern uh, police departments, those early Southern organized law enforcement organizations were overly concerned with the institution of slavery. One, with how uh, slaves were being managed, and two, how slaves' mobility was being limited. And the, the, the reason that the sort of, I, I bring up slaves' mobility and why that's important is because there's an echo there of the, the origins in the North. That sort of Northern origin story is a property security function. And that Southern origin story is also a property security function, except the property in question here is human property. And that human property is far more mobile than any property that would be present in a place like Boston. And so what you have here is the establishment of these, uh, these institutions. You have their instantiation in Southern law and Southern culture. You have a, 
you know, 200 plus year history of, of people, enslaved people, as well as free black people, recounting their experiences with these uh, bands of law enforcers, whether they were actually deputized or not deputized. And I think that what we see here, and, and this, this is certainly, I, I wanna be clear here that I'm not drawing straight lines from say 1667 Virginia to 2021 Minneapolis. Um, but I, I do wanna say that there are real echoes here about what is a criminal, what is criminalized behavior, and who should bear the burden of state surveillance. So sort of imagining all things being equal, one might imagine that state surveillance would itself as a public resource be deployed equally. But the reality is that there are communities that are overly surveilled. There are communities that as a result are overly criminalized and people in those communities bear far more burden for the interposition of the state in their day-to-day -day lives than people who live in other places. When I think about this original constitutional sin, um, to thinking of slavery as this original constitutional sin, the other thing that I, that I like to remind folks is that when it comes to, at least in the 17th century and the early 18th century, so this would be pre-revolutionary war and actually post-revolutionary war period, what we see very clearly in places like Virginia and South Carolina is people who appear to have African ancestry being taken up and accused of being fugitives for no other reason than the appearance of African ancestry. And so there is this presumption that gets written into the law. This, this does not happen early. This happens later in the 18th century, this presumption that African ancestry equals slave status. And if a person who, is, who carries slave status is not where they should be, then that person became literally criminalized. We're talking about slaves being held in local and county jails throughout the region. This is some of the research that I've been working on for quite a long time, really tracking the appearance of slaves in jails throughout the South. We see that these people are being held in these public law enforcement uh, facilities, not because they have been accused of any crime, but rather because their presence, right, not where they ought to be, their presence either off of away from a from a putative owner's property or somewhere out on the public road, that presence alone with this phenotype denoted criminal status. And it's it's something that I think we haven't really grappled with. What it means for a hundred years of US history, a hundred plus years of US history, to have an actual presumption in the law, a presumption that Supreme Court justices talk about. That, that, that state Supreme Court justices talk about, a presumption that someone who has clear African ancestry, observable African ancestry, is a person who is denoted to, who is presumed to be a slave unless they can prove otherwise. This, uh, this sort of uh, mental gymnastics, this mental leap, this determination that would carry the weight of law, I think, haunts us to this day, because there is there remains, and again, not that these are the same, but there remains this real entrenched resistance to grappling with why are certain people criminalized if, if aberrant behavior is equally distributed throughout the population. So how do we explain the over-presence, the, the, the over-representation of Black people or Latinos in our nation's prison systems? Again, if we know that 20% of people in prison are there for drug crimes, we know that drug usage is evenly distributed across the population, why is it that these populations continue to be overrepresented here? These are hard questions, I think, that we have not yet dealt with. The other thing that I'll mention in, in reference to your, your the part of your question about the, the Bill of Rights, at least in, when it comes to the institution of slavery and its protection, the, the most important Bill of Rights was always uh, the fifth, right? It's always the amendment that provides protection against the government interfering with property rights. And so when you have the property right 
in this case, a property right in human people being exalted to be the thing that people most want to talk about. I think that that this also leads to some maybe constitutional distortions that we come to think of property ownership and property holders as some exalted class of the citizenry who are deserving of more privileges and, and, and less interpositions of the state than other parts of the population. I think this further imbricates these distinctions between the property classes that I mentioned before when talking about Boston and the non-property classes, we still see that to this day. And um, that's that particular tangle wrapped up in the fifth is one that, that I don't see us um, unraveling anytime soon. Thanks. I, I so appreciate the, the nuance and clarity of that answer. Um, and I have a follow-up question but there's nothing a journalist loves more than a good transition. And um, the, the remarks that you made about the sort of the phenotypic mark of, of blackness and its connection to um, criminality is something that our, our next speaker, I think has, has written quite a lot about. And I just, I'd, I'd, I'd love to just turn there uh, to Bennett Capers, professor and professor of law and director, um, director of the Center on Race, Law, and Justice at Fordham Law School. Um, Bennett, you've written extensively about this idea of race as evidence. Can you unpack that for us and, and what that means and how it kind of connects back to the flaws baked into the origins of the criminal legal system? Absolutely. And I, I also have to say what a pleasure it is to be on this panel. Uh, as Taha was speaking, I was like sitting there nodding and taking notes. This is just great. So... <clears throat> I'm gonna answer this by actually uh, starting off by referencing the trial of Derek uh, Chauvin for murdering George Floyd, since that's in the background. And I'm gonna also start by mentioning a refrain that we hear time and time again in cases that obviously involve race. Um, and the refrain is essentially like race doesn't matter. So from the trial of the officer who shot Philando Castile, quote, this case has nothing to do with race. Um, in the trial of a white officer for shooting an undercover black officer, obviously friendly fire, supposedly, quote, this case has nothing to do with race. Uh, from the trial of George Zimmerman for killing uh, Trayvon Martin, um, this case has nothing to do with race. Um, and even from the disorderly conduct arrest of Harvard professor Henry Louis Skip Gates, um, the assertion, and again, I mean, for, he was arrested on suspicion of breaking into his own home, um, the refrain was, this case has nothing to do with race. And I mention all of this up front because I'm going to make an argument that I think won't come as a surprise to anybody in this audience, race matters. And as somebody who teaches and writes in the area of evidence law, I wanna take it a step further and say, as, as Jamil mentioned, race is evidence. So, Imagine a person is arrested, it could be anybody, it could be disorderly conduct, it could be failure to obey a valid police order, it could be drug arrest. Imagine the trial. The arresting officer and other officers and other witnesses will testify about what they observed, evidence will be admitted. And throughout the trial, race might never be mentioned. But it would be foolish to think race is absent. So as soon as prospective jurors walk into the courtroom, race will likely be the first thing they'll notice about the defendant. Even before they learn his name, even before they learn the charges, even before opening statements or any witnesses are called, and no matter how well-meaning they are, evidence suggests that they'll likely use race as evidence. And I think people know this, we just don't talk about it enough. So what does it mean to use race as evidence? I'm gonna <clears throat> mention a few studies and examples. So. Um, social condition research sort of demonstrates that we all have these implicit biases about race, that they're practically universal, and in particular this research suggests that we have a tendency to implicitly associate dark skin with criminality. In fact, one study of death penalty cases, they found a direct relationship between darkness and punishment all other things being equal. So as Jennifer Eberhardt, a Stanford researcher put it, quote, the more black, the more death worthy. Um, there's also, I'm gonna mention Justin Levinson's work, um, adapting implicit bias research to test its applicability to trial settings. And so in one study he gave mock jurors, like 
20 or so pieces of evidence to analyze. And the pieces of evidence included a photo um, of, um, of a gunman, but all you could see was the forearm and the hand. And what he did is for some of the mock jurors, um, the photo depicted a hand and forearm that was dark skin. For other mock jurors, the hand and forearm had lighter skin. Um, and he wanted to see like, did that matter at all? They were all otherwise looking at the same evidence, but of course, what the research showed was that mock jurors looking at darker skin were more likely to interpret all the other evidence that might have been ambiguous as sort of leaning towards guilt. Um, so again, you sort of have darkness and blackness um, sort of being a factor in how we judge even guilt or innocence. Um, I'm gonna mention one other study. Um, it's a study where um, participants were simply given a story. They were described a confrontation between a couple of individuals. And um, they were told um, sort of like, you know, let's say one of the individuals is black or whatever. Um, studies showed that the participants, when they were asked to later on recall the story, would add aggressiveness <laughs> that wasn't in the story to the black participant. For the white participant, they would do the opposite. They would forget aggressiveness. So they would act, this actually impacted how they even judge what was true and what happened. And all of this has implications for like every kind of trial we can imagine, including, including Derek Chauvin's trial right now. Um, so this is where I pivot to the whole history thing and sort of pick up and build on some of the stuff uh, Tia um, was saying. So one, one criticism of a lot of implicit biases is sort of describes the sort of biases we have, but doesn't really explain why we have those biases. But of course, when we look at history, it sort of all fits together. It's, it's not like anybody wakes up and suddenly has biases associating black skin with criminality or anything like that. All of that is connected to our history. So we all know, hopefully, that there was a deliberate effort after the Civil War to depict blacks as criminals. And this was done in part because it made it easier in the South to recreate slavery by another name. Since the 13th Amendment, which on its face abolished slavery, made an exception for the punishment for crime. Um, the result was a host of black codes and peonage laws and convict laws and then Jim Crow laws to sort of reassert this racial hierarchy. But even before the Civil War, going back to the original sin, there were slave codes that ensured that race would matter in terms of punishment and in terms of what was crime, returning to the theme that Russ mentioned and Tia mentioned. So I think it's important for everyone to keep in mind that at the same time, it was not a crime for whites to hold humans in bondage or to rape um, um, slaves um, in order to increase their property. Um, it was a crime for uh, slaves to move about freely, to gather in groups, or to possess weapons, or to own property. Um, in South Carolina, I'm glad Tia mentioned South Carolina, it's, it's actually the state where I'm from. <laughs> um, the Negro Code of 1735 even went so far as to specify the fabrics slaves were permitted to wear to make sure slaves did not dress above their station. And I think all of these laws, all of this has like an afterlife now and informs our present. And all of this, I think, contributes to what the Harvard historian Khalil Gibran Muhammad describes as writing crime into race. So there's one more aspect of this history I'm gonna to touch on if I have time. Hopefully somebody's, maybe somebody's sending me an alert about time already. Um, but uh, the history I'm gonna to touch on is just our history tying race to credibility. Um, so there's a long history where uh, non-whites, including Latinos and Asians, were prohibited from testifying against whites. Even after those laws became dead letters, we still tied race to credibility. So North Carolina courts, courts required the quote, whenever a person of color shall be examined as a witness, the court shall warn the witness to declare the truth. Because apparently, you know, unless the black got that warning, uh, they would lie. The Oregon Supreme Court twice ruled the Chinese witnesses must be viewed with special scrutiny, stating in one case, the quote, experience convinces everyone that the testimony of Chinese witnesses is very unreliable. 
And my point here is just that we're still living with this history now. Like, you know, James Baldwin said, the past isn't the past, it's, it's the present. I could add Faulkner quotes, all of this history matters. And I'm just going to say one last thing in my last 30 seconds. Um, just as we have these biases um, um, against uh, um, Blacks and other non-whites that impact the criminal justice system and that apply to history, we also have those same biases of privileged whiteness. So we associate whiteness with truth-telling and innocence. And all of this, again, is connected to our long history. So I will stop there. Thank you so much. Um, again, I think we've got some some good questions coming coming in, but I'd like to get to everyone, and then we'll we'll kind of dip back into some of these uh, some of these topics. I think. Um, so now I'd like to turn to Vince Warren, Executive Director for the Center for Constitutional Rights. Um, you know, building somewhat, I think, on, on Tajania's remarks, can you draw some lines for us um, from the the origins of the Constitution through to Terry stops and stop and frisk? Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's great to be with everybody. And thank you, Russ and ACS, for inviting me. This panel is extraordinary. And I, like Bennett, uh, wish that I were, in addition to wishing that I was in California to get my CLA credits, I also wish that I were able to fully focus and take notes on this. Um, I do want to build on what um, Tajania and Bennett were talking about on, with the question of uh, phenotype presumptions and how um, the history is present today. And looking at the Derek Chauvin trial, um, you know, folks have talked about how America's values are on trial and the justice system is on trial and those things are true, but really what's on trial is white supremacy. And the challenge is white supremacy has some of the best lawyers in the country uh, for the last uh, several hundred years going to bat. And I think we're all a part of that, um, a part of that challenge. And, he and here's why I say that. If for people on this call, um, look in your heart and think about the percentage likelihood of a conviction on this case. Um, I don't think anybody would bet um, their kid's college fund on a conviction. And I think that speaks volumes to um, how a prosecution function like this, particularly where there's a police officer, and even when um, there is super clear evidence, uh, nine minutes and 23 seconds worth of uh, egregious behavior that led to somebody's death. There is still a question, even for those of us in the biz, about how this thing is going to turn out. There's a reason why, as we all know, as a former um, defense attorney, there's a reason why the defense is really looking uh, to have more white people on the jury. And there's a reason why the prosecution is looking to have more black people on the jury. And it's not, I would submit, uh, because of <clears throat> that people are going to disregard the evidence. I think that the, the reason why they're looking for different types of people is because that evidence hits different jurors differently. The evidence presented hits black people differently than it hits white people. White people studies show are much more inclined to, um, to agree with, support, understand, and rationalize um, police officer behavior in light of the circumstances at the time, in light of the actions of the, of the victim, in light of their training. Um, this is baked into our system. And um, if we look at the, the out, possible outcomes of this trial, I mean, there are two. One is that the prosecution proves that uh, Derek Chauvin overstepped uh, what he was supposed to be doing and caused the death. And that might lead to a conviction, it might not. But even if it does, what that does is it, ex it exceptionalizes Officer Chauvin's behavior in ways that do nothing to prevent uh, uh, future officers from coming up with other ways of doing this. If nine minutes and 23 seconds is too much, somebody might try six minutes and 23 seconds. On the other hand, um, if um, it turns out that the defense is, is successful in convincing the jury that as they're arguing that he was trained to do precisely this, um, then our problem is that we in a society now have, a, as, as um, my colleagues were saying before me, we, we're in a society in, in which we now have rules, written rules and training and affirmative training around um, the killing and extinction 
of black people at the hands of law enforcement, not a new rule. This is something that has really traveled with us as we've been thinking about what just, justice and democracy looks like. So uh, that's what's weighing on my mind. And I would just like to talk a little bit about um, Fourth Amendment, if I could. And um, one of the, the pieces of how this plays out, um, you know, I'm with the Center for Constitutional Rights and we litigated the stop and frisk case in New York successfully. We're currently litigating a case called Black Love Resist in the Rust um, against the city of Buffalo. But what we've learned and what I've learned um, from talking to folks is that the Fourth Amendment, which um, as a civil libertarian principle is excellent, um, as a practical matter when it comes to dealing with the police works to the profound disadvantage of black people. And this is what I mean. Um, every black person in America knows that when the police tell you to do something and you don't do it, there are gonna be consequences. Whether or not the police have a reasonable belief that you've done something wrong, whether or not what they're asking you to do is within the bounds of their training, within the bounds of the constitution. If you don't do it, there will be consequences. So as a result, if a police officer on a street stop says, pulls out a gun, throws somebody up against the wall and says, do the hokey pokey. And the person says, I'm sorry, officer, under the fourth amendment, I'd, I'd have a, uh, uh, I have, I would like to know why you're stopping me, why I'm being seized, what's going on here. That assertion, the citizen assertion of the Fourth Amendment can and very often does lead to um, incarceration, physical violence, brutality, and even death. The Fourth Amendment is an illusion when it comes to street stops uh, for police officers and Black people. And I think it's worth us considering um, if, that is, if that is in fact the case, if there is no uh, if there is no opportunity to assert your rights in the context of a police encounter for black people, um, then we have to look at our fealty, our um, our support and uh, how we look at legally, how we look at the question of fourth amendment stops because um, essentially black people can be stopped for anything and can be killed for doing nothing. We've seen this time and time again. And bringing that to, um, the cases uh, at hand that I was mentioning is that the stop and frisk case is a really perfect example of the phenotypic, phenotypic uh, presumption that um, Tajania was talking about. The idea that people were being stopped in New York City based solely on their race, on how they present. You know, 85% of the stops were for black and uh, Latino men, even though, um, that people who were stopped only were found to have contraband 10% of the time, regardless of race. Um, that, that tells you that in the way that we think about law enforcement is essentially one that it doesn't function without a criminal, um, a criminalization presumption and it doesn't function without a race presumption. And if those two presumptions are present, um, then I think we probably can't call it a criminal justice system because from the get go, uh, black people and brown people are on the back foot. And it doesn't necessarily just have to, um, as Russ was mentioning, have to deal with violent police encounters that end up in the death of black people. Um, in the city of Buffalo, in 2012, the city of Buffalo um, Police Department created a strike, strike force, which was gonna be aggressively patrolling, conducting vehicle checkpoints in high crime areas. And just as an aside, high crime areas, which plays into um, the uh, Terry stops and the street stops and what is reasonable for a police officer to do, what is reasonable um, for how for the police officers are deployed, high crime areas are a criminalized uh, pretext for black areas. Uh, because as we found in the stop and frisk case, they were stopping and frisking black folks in high crime, low crime areas, predominantly black, predominantly white, um, mixed areas. And that doesn't go to, th that fact didn't go to the fact that there was no 14th Amendment problem since they were policing aggressively in all of these areas in New York. What it did was it went more to the historical point that um, being black in a white neighborhood made you um, subject to police searches for different reasons than perhaps being black in a black neighborhood or a black in a black poor neighborhood. So it's not that it's not racist, it's that it, it's race plays out in a variety of different ways as um, 
as uh, we talked about, as migration happens. And so the other question that is there actually freedom of movement, even in our cities, if you venture in from one neighborhood to another, uh, it can only heighten in some ways uh, the target on your back. In the city of Buffalo, um, police, the, they uh, created these vehicle checkpoints um, that could last for about 45 uh, minutes at a time. And they set these vehicle traffic points in three census tracts, uh, all of which together accounted for about 88% of the black population. And why that's a problem aside from the 14th Amendment problem is that what these vehicle checkpoints did was they would aggressively issue tickets for vehicles. And this is not just that um, you don't have a license and a registration. This was a situation where, for example, um, if you had tinted windows, you would get five or six, depending on the size of your car, uh, very expensive tickets for each tinted window. So our clients uh, got thousands of dollars worth of tickets just from one particular um, street stop. And the way that that manifest was that this turned into um, a an income generating policy for the city. So quite literally, um, the Innovations in downtown Baltimore were funded off of the traffic tickets of black people that had been targeted very much like the way the slave patrols had tried to round up and to surveil the, uh, the circumference of plantations. So um, the case can be made that the historical is now. And I think the question for us as lawyers is, are we gonna continue to look for the reasonableness in the actions that we know that are unreasonable? Are we going to continue to look for training and retraining on different mechanisms that we know will be deployed in unreasonable manners? Or are we gonna invest in black communities is which, um, which is what the Center for Constitutional Rights is calling for is to really invest more in black community safety and to divest more from policing of black communities because Policing of black communities does not equal community safety for any community and particularly for black communities. That's interesting. And, and Vince, while you were talking, I, I couldn't help but think about uh, cer certainly, obviously, um, Ferguson and the, the uh, report that the Department of Justice did there in the wake of Mike Brown's death. Um, but it also, it, you know, it, it made me think about reconstruction and how you know before the abolition of slavery slaves were treated as property and to the extent that this um criminal legal system uh existed in this in this early stage it was to just make sure that that remained true um after uh, slavery was abolished, right? The, the 13th Amendment gave way to the convict lease system, which was a way of actually taking people who were conceptually, legally, constitutionally free and converting them back into something that capital could use um, for its own purposes. And it, it, um, it, I, I just, it, it makes me think about some of the, the interesting iterations that all of this goes through, right? There, there are linkages throughout, but um, there, are, there are new logics that get applied when the, when the legal languages and the legal frameworks change. That wasn't a question. Uh, that's just a thought. Um, yeah, plus, plus one on that one. Yeah. Um, I'd like to lastly turn to uh, Seema Gajwani, uh, Special Counsel for Juvenile Justice Reform and Chief of the Restorative, uh, Restorative Justice Section at the Office of the Attorney General for uh, the District of Colum Columbia. Uh, Seema, one of the goals of this panel was to think about restorative justice and other less traditional approaches, or you could say less punitive approaches. I wonder if um, you could tell us a bit about your work on restorative justice in D.C. And um, you know, I, don't, I don't think you have to sell the crowd for this panel on the value of a restorative justice approach as a concept. Um, but I do wonder if you can shed light on shed light for us on what the real world application has been like. Um, where are the political fault lines? Um, do they feel movable or do they feel kind of stuck in place? Thank you. Um, let me first start by saying uh, plus one to everything <laughs> our, our panelists have already said. I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much to ACS and Mr. Feingold and to Christopher. Um, for inviting me. Uh, I'm 
especially honored because of this uh, incredible panel. Uh, like everyone has mentioned, I've been um, both trying to take notes and also think of what I'm supposed to say to um, follow uh, these brilliant speakers. So anyway, thank you. Um, I guess let me start by talking about the way that I think about restorative justice in the context of America's history um, of use of state violence towards Black Americans. I think it's helpful for me to center restorative justice in that context and that history. And, um, you know, Professor Capers and Dean Henderson uh, and, and Mr. Warren have all spoken a lot of different about different aspects about this. Um, so I don't need to go into great depth, but, you know, our criminal justice system has in its roots, um, you know, slavery and Jim Crow and lynchings and terror. And this state violence um, continues today. And as um, Professor Capers said, the past informs the present. And we see that uh, in, our, in our criminal justice system, in our courtrooms, in the way we do justice today, uh, really palpably, I certainly do. Um, you know, today state violence looks like mass incarceration of mostly Black Americans. It looks like police brutality, as we've, we've talked about already. It looks like children who are tried as adults for crimes. Um, uh, it looks like prisons that are filled with violence and brutality and a lack of services and rehabilitation. Uh, and, it, and it looks like, to me, um, stigma and humiliation um, of Black and Brown uh, people in court, and I work in the juvenile justice system currently, and so the stigma and the humiliation of Black children and their families in court, uh, in obvious ways like shackles um, around children's waists and ankles and wrists, um, and uh, um, every time they're brought into court. Um, and so I think about uh, the violence that the state has perpetuated um, historically and currently specifically around Black people. And also, I have to think about it, working in the justice system, working currently in a prosecutor's office, um, also when we face violence in communities. And I think uh, it, it always reminds me of um, when Martin Luther King Jr. and John Lewis called for nonviolence and they've um, said in the teachings about nonviolence, talk a lot about how you can't meet violence with violence. And that's what we that's what we are doing. That's what we've done in the past. And nonviolence as a concept is not a passive thing. It's actually quite difficult. It requires that we tap into a higher standard of humanity to envision an alternative um, to what we're doing. And I think we have to do that here with our justice system. Um, we, of course, must hold people accountable, um, but we also... I believe uh, need to really center and focus on human dignity when we do so. And that's why I think restorative justice presents itself as a possible um, alternative to our current criminal legal system, uh, a way to re-envision kind of accountability uh, in a way that centers dignity uh, and is also um, uh, honoring of the history uh, that the state has played in, in violence towards particularly Black Americans and currently does too. Um, so restorative justice is really, um, you know, a, it's actually quite a simple concept. It's where when uh, it's it's a practice and there are many applications of it, but in the context of crime, it is, a, is a, an offer to people who are impacted by crime to come together um, and uh, address what happened, address how people were affected by what happened, and co-create uh, ways uh, to make it right to the extent possible so that, that folks can move forward and are less likely to commit that kind of behavior again. Uh, and the way um, that we uh, interpret restorative justice currently at my office, uh, I work at the office of the, uh, the, of the Attorney General here in Washington, DC, which is local government. Uh, I work in an office that primarily prosecutes juvenile crime because of the nature of Washington, D.C. Um, but uh, as the juvenile prosecutors, we have an enormous amount of control over 
uh, justice for juveniles. And so what we've done is we've created a restorative justice program within the prosecutor's office. It is the first, uh, it's the only restorative justice program that is housed within the prosecutor's office. And uh, that was important, it's important for various reasons to me, uh, uh, though there are restorative justice programs that are community-based across the country and are, are fantastic and do great work. It's in part important to me because we are, because the fact that we're in the prosecutor's office gives us the ability to have control over uh, prosecution which uh, in many ways it's the prosecutors that have fueled mass incarceration over the last um, 30, 40 years. And uh, we have an enormous amount of power and control in the justice system. Um, restorative justice uh, really speaks to accountability um, and its features are uh, features of healing and closure, accountability, building empathy, and resolution and, and redemption. Whereas um, if you go into courtrooms across the country today, what you'll see about our current criminal legal system, juvenile and adult, is that its features are really about uh, shame and stigma and criminalization and, and brutality, uh, psychological brutality, um, and also a real uh, um, dismissal of, um, the impact of crime on victims, um, frankly. And so, um, you know, one thing that I, I sometimes uh, talk about is uh, I heard a quote when I was first being trained in restorative justice, uh, one of the trainers played a video snippet from Brene Brown, who at the time I didn't know who, who that was. Now I know she's like kind of an inspirational speaker um, and famous. <laughs> But at the time, uh, I, I remember learning about restorative justice and, and this quote um, talks about the difference between shame and guilt. And, and she explained that shame says, I'm a bad person. And guilt says, I did a bad thing. And she says that shame is highly correlated with things like addiction and depression, self-harm and violence. But guilt is different. And guilt is actually inversely correlated with those things. Because with guilt, there is a path to redemption built in it. Because you are not the bad thing. You have the ability to try and make it right. And she says, the ability to hold something that we have done wrong or failed to do up against who we want to be is incredibly adaptive. It's uncomfortable, but it's adaptive. And that's how we learn from our mistakes. I believe that's the heart of restorative justice but that is not the heart of our current justice system. Um, our current justice system, you know, focuses, it, it helps encourage shame. In fact, um, there's a lot of research that shows um, that the drivers of violence, that, that the four drivers of violence are shame, isolation, exposure to violence, and lack of economic opportunities shame, isolation, exposure to violence and lack of economic opportunities. And that's essentially what our prison system creates. Um, and we do the same thing in courtrooms and courthouses every day. And Professor Capers talks about it in the context of trial, Dean Henderson, Mr. Warren in the context of policing, but it's in the features of our courtrooms. It's in the silencing of our young people who are charged with crime and their families. It's um, the way that, uh, we, um, we sterilize the emotion out of our courtrooms in order to churn people through this machine and spit them out. Um, it is how we dehumanize people today. That's what is the court system is how we do that. And uh, restorative justice, I believe, seeks to stop that, um, to use restorative justice facilitators to build trust and safety with all parties who've been infected by crime, be it the person who's been charged, the victim of crime, their supporters, their family members, community members, so that they can have the emotional conversation about what was a rupture in the social norms, see it as what it was, have the young people who committed the crime have the agency and build the courage to be able to speak about what happened, hear about how it's impacted somebody, apologize, and then be able to make it right and move forward in a way that allows them to redeem themselves 
uh, and all the while offering healing and closure to victims of crime. That's how I think of um, the ways that restorative justice as an alternative approach can combat and, and be an alternative to what I see as just the blatant racism in our current um, justice system um, that we all see as innocuous. The so many the features of our justice system that are degrading and humiliating that we see as innocuous and procedural. Absolutely, or what, what Alex Karakasanis calls the, the usual cruelty. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's so much there that I would honestly love to dig into, but I know we're starting to push up against um, the, end, the end of our, our panel. There's one thing that, that we had put in the, um, uh, in the description uh, that we haven't touched yet, and I'd love to po pose to Vince first, but I'm also curious if, if others have thoughts about this, which is the ways that punitive answers um, to uh, racist crimes, racial discrimination, and, and racial violence, for example, uh, terrorism statutes. Uh, you'll find uh, you know, conversations about this related to the January 6th insurrection or related to the, um, the uh, massage parlor or the spa attacks in, in Atlanta um, several weeks ago. Um, a, a lot of times, laws intended to... Uh, to punitively address harm against communities of color or theoretically could address harm against communities of color um, actually wind up harming communities of color and being disproportionately, um, uh, those folks wind up being disproportionately prosecuted under those statutes. Um, Vince, can you talk us through a little bit about how that happens, why that happens and, and you know, shed some light there. Sure, and I, I'm going to approach this from a, a not, another body of work that we do at the Center for Constitutional Rights, is, which has been uh, a lot of our post 9-11 work. So uh, working on behalf of Muslim and South Asian and Arab communities who have borne the brunt of the post 9-11 um, sort of explosion of uh, domestic terrorism rules and laws and things like that. And I would just start off by saying it's that it's important for us to recognize that we have a punitive reflex in this country. And so we, we shouldn't assume that it's a neutralized one and that we only punish um, in response to violence or as um, Seema was, was saying that, you know, we, we actually do, I, I think we respond violently, um, which also then sort of stems and, and, and grows, grows the violence. So we have a punitive reflex. And so our, the challenge is that we've been struggling with in the law for so long is that if it is actually true that people commit violence, people, not the state, mind you, commit violence on behalf of, sorry, based upon um, phenotype based upon uh, the way people present um, and those and those and in our law we do those identities then how should we deal with it and the way that we deal with it is with punishment and so uh, two examples are the um, hate crime statutes which will use enhanced penalties if it can be proven in court that the person did this because of racial animus or, or things like that and another way that we do that, is in um, the current framing, which is which has its, which we are dangerously close to repeating some of the mistakes that we made in the post 9-11 period in the first 20 years of domestic terrorism. So the idea is I had a conversation with folks in, um, with people who are freedom fighters, fighters in South Africa. This is, and I had this conversation after 9-11 and I said, well, how do you feel about the idea of domestic terrorism? Uh, because it seems to me that um, the, there are so many tools that the state has to be able to prosecute people as it is. Why is it necessary to, to uh, frame it as domestic terrorism? And the folks who were part of the freedom struggle in South Africa said to me, this was precisely the challenge that we had uh, in South Africa against the apartheid regime, that it wasn't enough that we were black. We were also black and we were trying to get out of the thumb of the repression that we were in. And the only way that uh, they could do that would be to criminalize us as terrorists. And and so we actually, they, the South African freedom fighters, did not use the terrorism frame because it's essentially a state narrative 
And it's a narrative that is a one-way ratchet for increased penalties. And it's also a one-way ratchet for state control over the frame of who is a terrorist and who is not. In the same way that we have a one-way ratchet um, using it in the current context with um, who is a criminal and who is not. And this is not based on actions. This is based on group, uh, uh, on group perception and, and group punishment. So um, we at the Center for Constitutional Rights really do push back and would urge people to rethink the idea of enhanced penalties, because as we know from the post 9-11 period with uh, Muslim South Asian and Arab folks, that the, uh, the rules and the laws and the policies, which are all mostly subjudicial, by the way, a lot of these things never actually get into court. Group punishment never gets into court. It gets into court as individual punishment for individual acts. But the framework and the, inf and the effect is that the entire group is criminalized. Um, and so we push back on that because what we've seen um, and what we, I think is clear to everybody is that the Muslim South Asian uh, community was considered a, a soup of potential terrorism no matter what anybody was doing, no matter how long they've been here. And that framework has done more to, I think, not only criminalize that community, but it's unmoored our jurisprudence from the rationality of being able to, and I'm not suggesting that we do this all the time, but to be able to fo follow acts with appropriate punishment. Now what we're trying to do is we're trying to prevent criminal acts by creating a, cr a criminalized framework that will deter people from doing these things, but you end up criminalizing the community. So um, the, the last piece I would say is Black Lives Matter protests were happening 2014, 2015, 2016. And by 2017, all of a sudden we had the framework of the black identity extremists, which was being pushed by uh, the FBI and other folks. This uh, Color of Change and CCR did a Freedom of Information Act request. Um, there's actually a uh, a black framework that has been circulated in federal law enforcement communities trying to figure out which of the black activists um, could be considered terrorist or, or, or connected to terrorist activity for the purposes of shutting down the movement. So last thing I'll say is um, going back to what um, Tajania was, uh, uh, Nia Taj, excuse me, was saying that you cannot escape enslavement and just be a free person. When you escape enslavement, you become criminalized. You are a fugitive and there's a range of laws that sort of rain down on you. And it is similar to, I think, how black freedom fighters in the United States are experiencing this idea that if we are throwing off the yoke and, and disrupting and demanding that things change, um, we don't become freedom fi fighters in the eyes of law enforcement. We become terrorists and uh, criminals in the eyes of law enforcement. So all of these things um, will only be used more forcefully and with greater aplomb and to the applause of the nation some, at some point um, against communities of color, even though they're put in to protect communities of color. Thank you. Does, does anyone have anyone th anything to add to that? And apologies to Dean Henderson for um, messing up her name. <laughs> Great. I, um, I would love to encourage uh, our participants, uh, any questions you have, please get those in now. Um, one really good question that we have here um, is a, a question of, of language that I think uh, is, is, is worth putting to the group. Could someone speak to the, the use of the term original sin and whether it, further, it furthers indigenous erasure from history or is it just semantics? As our first speaker framed rather well, property and slavery went hand in hand as did genocide and stolen land. And I think obviously you won't find any uh, disagreement with that point, I think, on this panel. Um, I, I often think that 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 phrase, when that phrase original sin gets used, I think it, it is usually gesturing at both slavery and genocide of, of indigenous people. Um, but if anyone had anything to uh, to add to that, I'd love to hear it. I, I really appreciate the question and I'm, I'm glad that you uh, opted to address it live. I think that um, 
there is always this risk, right, of, of indigenous erasure and particularly the erasure of crimes and terror and brutality against indigenous people. So you not only are erasing the people, but you are erasing sort of what's been done to them as if they, you know, just sort of walked off into the sunset in some mythic sense. And I think that that, that, that is a real danger. I'd, I'd um, just like to, to hold out that I, um, I teach property and I was just talking to a group yesterday about how in law schools around the country, students are not there. We are only, our students are only asked once to grapple with the question of indigenous erasure and land theft. And that one time is, is, you know, maybe one class. And then after that, we act as if, because it happened a long time ago, because it happened a long time ago, even though it's still happening, but that's a side story, right? Because it happened a long time ago, then it's sort of become legitimate by, by operation of, by the passage of time and how dangerous that is when we as, as lawyers and law professors fail to remind our students on a regular basis that what they think of as sort of a natural property rights have never actually been natural and have only ever been both staked and defended on, um, with the with the blood and the gore of of uh, uh, Indian nations, and so I, I like I, I I'm glad that we have this opportunity um, to talk about that, and I think particularly because ACS is a group of of lawyers and law students, it is a good reminder that uh, that we all have um, that this is a shared history. This is not a sort of a, a history that is. Um, you know, uh, uh, that history over there that we don't need to know about, it's a shared history. And to the extent that we are not explicit about where our claims come from, where our land claims come from, where our, um, where our, our border, border claims come from, if we're not explicit about that, then I think we, we replicate this harm for the next generation of folks to sort of act as if this was no big deal, when in fact it was uh, cataclysmic. Thank you. Um, there's there's one other outstanding question, which is a, a SCOTUS question on property. So I'm going to put that to you, Tajania. Um, do you think the relatively, and this is in quotes, good Fourth Amendment case law from conservative justices stems back to the point of a purported higher protected class of property owners? I, I do, but the Fourth Amendment question should go to Bennett. Yeah. <laughs> The answer is yes. <laughs> You're seeing the, the privileging of, of property and the privileging of property uh, people, specifically property males and the, the use of property to constitute citizenship. All of that is happening in these Fourth Amendment cases, the, the, the quote good ones. Um, it's in the background and we should be seeing it and calling it and naming it because it's there. I defer to Bennett on Fourth Amendment questions. So, so it's interesting, as, as soon as Dean Henderson mentioned the Fifth Amendment in her presentation, I really wanted to engage in a conversation about the Fourth Amendment, because it's, it's the same story. I mean, the you look at, and, and I think what the questioner is really getting at is, we think of the Fourth Amendment, and we think of uh, the cases from the Supreme Court, and the, there's so many cases basically benefiting the government and making it harder for citizens. Um, but the one exception seems to be cases that sort of touch on property. So as soon as anything approaches the home, we have all these decisions authored by Justice Scalia, where he is, um, you know, um, solidifying the Fourth Amendment right and ruling against the government um, because he wants to preserve the sanctity of the home. And of course that privileges people who have homes even, even outside the home context, just to give another quick, ex well, maybe two quick examples. Um, sort of in deciding whether something is a search or not, we ask about the reasonable expectation of privacy. But we've always had a country where we sort of say like, well, people who have <laughs> already have an expectation of privacy, people who do not, do not have an expectation of privacy. That's why it's so much easier to conduct surveillance and like, you know, housing projects than it is any place else in the country, because we already give those people reduced expectation of privacy. And if we could talk again about, you know, original sin, 
constitution, whatever you want to call it, the Bill of Rights. I mean, I always comment on the fact that if you look at the Fourth Amendment protecting persons, houses, papers, and effects, think about who did not have any of those things when the Fourth Amendment was ratified. And think about who did. Great answer. Thank you. Um, the next question is for, for Seema, certainly. Um, but anyone else who has thoughts, please chime in. There's been a lot of success in applying restorative justice uh, principles to juvenile cases or interpersonal violence cases. Um, how does it apply as a as a police reporter, I'll say, or maybe reframe this question. How could it apply? Because I, I don't I don't know that this has been tried much. How could it apply to p cases of, of police violence? Um, I think I'll, I'll start by saying that a couple of the preconditions to restorative justice are one, um, that the person who's been charged or accused of the crime is willing and interested in taking responsibility for their behavior, uh, and doesn't want to exercise their constitutional right to go to trial. Um, and that the other is that both parties are committed to resolution. And that's just not always the case, but it, it needs to be in order to go forward with restorative justice. In our work, uh, we've been doing restorative justice for four years or so in our office, mostly with juvenile um, youth, youth who've been accused of crimes. Um, uh, and what we find is that I, I'm constantly shocked at how many victims of crime, even ones who've been hurt, sometimes badly hurt, are willing and interested in doing restorative justice. I'm also surprised, frankly, at how um, frequently, in our case, the young people who committed the crimes are willing and interested in taking responsibility for their behavior. Um, but putting that aside, about, about police violence, I also don't know about a ton of cases where restorative justice has been used. I was actually brought in on a, a case outside of Washington, D.C., uh, in a situation of police violence. And what was interesting in that case, it ultimately, because of procedural problems, didn't end up resulting in a restorative justice conference where both sides were brought together. But in that situation, both sides were interested in resolution. And uh, in restorative justice, the facilitator works very extensively with both sides kind of separately um, before bringing them together. And so I had done a lot of that in this matter. And there were lots of issues of race and oppression and uh, discrimination. Um, but on both sides, there were issues of shame and guilt too. And uh, through the process, what was clear in just the pre-conference, before we brought people together, just talking through with each side, both the person and their immediate supporters, um, because a lot of the situation was in the news, um, both sides were able to see each other as human beings in a way that before the incident, there was a lot less of an opportunity to do so. And as a result, both sides were really compassionate to each other. They were still angry, traumatized, um, fearful, but they had a level of compassion for the other side, which only comes when you can see the other side as human. Even when you had a police officer who hurt another person. And that was really astounding to me. And what was clear is if we were able to bring them together, it would have been healing for both sides. And they probably would have gotten more out of the situation um, than they did. Uh, I'll also just really quickly say that in our, in our office, we have sometimes had the case where the young person who's been charged with a crime is charged with assault on a police officer, and we have to go to a police officer as the victim and say, would you be interested in doing restorative justice? We certainly have cases where the police officer is like, no way, no way. <laughs> but we also have situations where the police officer has said yes. And so we have facilitated probably half a dozen uh, APOs, assault on a police officer cases, and they are also some of uh, the most interesting, they're all very, all these, these, these restorative justice situations tend to be emotional, but interesting situations because we bring together people and what has, in those conferences, what's often come out is that police officers 
in these situations, and they're self-selected. These are police officers who are interested in doing this, but those who do are really interested in telling their story to the young person and their family. They're interested in saying like, I didn't come into this profession to lock up black boys. You know, I grew up in this kind of situation. This is my history. This is why I wanted to be a police officer. And they really want to tell that story. And similarly, the young people and their families oftentimes in those situations speak really authentically about what it feels like to be surveilled and oppressed by police in their neighborhoods. They speak about what it feels like when police officers come in and they target them and they treat them roughly and with disrespect when somebody is arrested and they're kept on the curb with handcuffs handcuffs for hours so people walking by can just see them and see them as a monster. And they speak about these things um, very emotionally and it's powerful on both sides. In one of the uh, restorative justice conferences, after two, three hours of going through these conversations, I remember um, the mother of one of the young people charged with assault on a police officer said, I've, you know, and sometimes in these conferences, what ends up happening is the sides end up wanting to stay in touch and to stay connected. And so they had decided upon that as part of their agreement going forward. And this mom said, I've never, I've always seen police in a particular light. I've never seen somebody like this. And in the same conference, the police officer was trying to offer something to the boy and said, you know, if you'd ever like me to take you on a ride along, I'm happy to do that. I want you to come in. And, and the kid was like, no way. I can't be seen with you. <laughs> like, you don't understand. And it was a funny moment, but they did connect. And he said, I've never had a friend who's a police officer. It's a great answer. Thank you so much for that. Um, before we wrap up, I, I, I I wanted to just kind of throw one last kind of big picture question out to the whole panel. Um, uh, going back to this question about our founding documents, which uh, for their uh, considerable brill brilliance, I mean, two of the organizations represented here uh, today are, are named for the promise of constitutionality after all. Um, they, they were and remain flawed efforts by flawed people uh, living by the logics of their day. Uh, so too have all the various additions and subtractions to the criminal legal system right up to the present day been imperfect products of imperfect actors to clearly manifestly imperfect results. Um, so I guess the question is, how can criminal legal professionals, uh, many of, you know, which includes many of the people um, on this call, uh, best work to, I guess we'll say, preserve the baby and dump out the bathwater there. I'll just say that there's a lot of dumping to do. <laughs> um, I think we really need to be very creative and thoughtful about our history, keeping our history centered in our minds and, um, and really re-envision a new system and think about what is the imp what are we trying to do we've forgotten certainly in the juvenile justice system we've forgotten we talk about rehabilitation and treatment and that's not what it's about it's about punishment it's degrading uh, what it should be about is behavior change and so the question should be how do children learn from their mistakes but we don't see them as children we don't see them as mistakes we see um, everyone who's been charged with a crime as the, as the embodiment of the worst thing that they've done. And of course, then our response is punitive and brutal and harkens back to our history. And so we really need to think hard, I believe, about what a, a new system could look like. Can I just add to that? I, I also think thinking hard about a new system means um, being able to um, question everything about the current system. So, um, you know, we take it for granted that the state needs to be involved in a lot of things that the state does not need to be involved in. I think, you know, one question we haven't asked is, if the system is, if racism is, if racism is endemic in the system, why is it that we are still a society where people call the police all the time, often when there's no need to call the police? Um, and one thing, I mean, I was, I, I, I was listening to Seema about restorative justice, which I love, but I also wish like 
can we take restorative justice outside, completely outside the criminal justice system? Like, why does it have to be charges filed or somebody accused? Like, why can't somebody who's harmed simply go to SEMA and say, I've been harmed. Can your organization help me without getting the police or the state involved at all? I think that I agree. I think the current movement in uh, abolitionist spaces, asking us to imagine different models for organizing civil society. I think that this is a real uh, a learning opportunity. This is a real moment to discard or to think about discarding that which does not work. And particularly when we have ample evidence that there are certain parts, there are certain elements of the current uh, criminal justice system that simply um, is unworkable. Why do we persist? Why do we allow these things to persist? I think we have to be willing to ask some hard questions about our own complacency, about what we demand of our elected officials, about um, our advocacy work for uh, with respect to the, the judiciary. I think that there's just quite a bit of sort of outward facing work and inward facing work yet to be done. And one thing that I like to encourage um, students and, and lawyer, law students and lawyers to, to also think about is to think about connecting with, with organizations in your communities that are doing this work. You, we, lawyers are, are not, need not be at the vanguard. <laughs> Community folks can be and should be at the vanguard of some of these movements. And if, if there is an opportunity um, to help to uh, uplift some of that work and to um, increase capacity in some of these community spaces, then I hope lawyers and law students will see value in that, even though it is not as maybe as flashy as um, some other opportunities. I think that's where the real work is happening. And that's where um, uh, people can really get, get, get clear about what people who live in these impacted communities want. Fantastic. And fantastic. And and Bennett, you'd you'd asked uh, if we could ask questions to one another. I know we're we're running very much on the the end of our time here, but if you had a question, it's been such a great conversation. I'd I'd love to uh, give you that opportunity. I think I got my point across in my last uh, <laughs> my <Okay>. last rant. <laughs> great. Um, well, I want to thank you all. This has been um, just a, a really great panel. Um, uh, and I've been done a lot of panels over the uh, over the course of the pandemic. Uh, don't tell the other panels, but this is one of the best ones. Um, I, I really appreciated all the points made and um, the, the the thoughtfulness of the conversation. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your questions, and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jamiles. <laughs>